Hey, welcome to another episode of A Woman Full of Soul. I am here today with my friend Sandra, who is a fitness coach and does a lot of other things. And she's going to talk to you more about what she does and what it looks like to her um, and for her to be a woman full of soul. So Sandra, I'm going to have you start with telling us um, what you do every day and what your everyday looks like. Um, what does that include right now during COVID? COVID. Well, <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for having me on the Woman Full of Soul podcast or videos or audio. It's great. I, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative. So I, as Mary said, my name is Sandra Kim, and I identify mostly as an Asian American, uh, both a psychotherapist and a fitness instructor. I've also um, have had other jobs. I'm a career changer. I, I was a pastor, a youth pastor at one point, and also administrative worker and an art teacher. Uh, so I've worn different hats throughout my life. And I think what resonates with me um, with the stuff that I do is mostly to be a helper because um, that gives such enrichment and such soul for me when I help others. Um, so in my career traje trajectory, you could see that I've, also, I've always been in some sort of helping position because that really, that's what gives meaning to my life. During COVID, I've had the lucky fortune to be a psychotherapist and I transitioned from working at a university um, straight to doing teletherapy, which I, I know I'm super blessed uh, to have that position and privileged. And as many people know during COVID, we are experiencing a mental health crisis. And it, it, the landscape right now is, um, is hard, it's difficult. But at the same time for myself, I, I'm always able to have a job and continue to help people. My fitness instruction part, I've been doing it since 2006. So that's about 15 years now. And, or for, you know, yeah, 15, 14, 15 years. And I started out kickboxing and then I moved to uh, more body weights and now I do Zumba. And I really believe in the power of movement and working out and just self-care. Mary, I know you, you do too. Yeah. Um, just getting out there. Um, generally, it's been in the club, but now it's been virtually. But that has saved my soul. Just being able to connect to people, particularly during lockdown, everybody was stay at home. And doing the fitness portion really helped me to, uh, to balance myself out. So um, I'm also a mother of a three-year-old. Um, luckily, she's not um, in school yet. So the whole homeschooling, I mean, we're starting her on reading and arithmetic and, and arts and all that, but it wasn't as difficult for me. And she's, she's both you know, a challenge, but also a joy, as all mothers know with mm -hmm. children. Uh, but I, I've been blessed to have the perspective that having her as well has kept me balanced because it keeps me in the present time, in the now, the here and now, which I also believe that we need to be as cognizant and self-aware as possible. What is going on now? How are we feeling? Where do we feel it? Um, what's going on in our world? Particularly so we don't have regrets on our choices and decisions we make at this point. So that was a mouthful, but that, that's what I do. That was currently. awesome. That was, yeah, that's really great and full of, um, full of helpful information, I think, for other people too, to help them to um, really explore where they are at right now too, in the middle of COVID. What has been most difficult for you during COVID and what are three positive changes that have occurred in your life during this time? So, so if you can't garner already from my personality, I, I'm an extrovert and I need, I'm a people person mm -hmm. and I need people um, to feel, you know, to feel more alive. And so I was afraid when we went into lockdown and we, we have to, you know, sort of be at home or socially distance that that would really affect me. I think that was a big fear uh, because I, I connect to people. I, um, I hug people. Right. 
I, I'm the I, same type of person. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> it's been very hard, especially if you've been trained in ministry and you're used mm -hmm. to doing face-to-face -face ministry. This is challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So I do have to say, you know, the, the silver lining in my fitness classes has been the fact that when people turn on their videos and even if they don't, there is some sort of connection. Mm -hmm. And I am a true believer of connection. And I know um, as a psychotherapist, connection is actually the number one way to living a longer, fuller life. And it even surpasses good eating, health, family, friends. It's just mm -hmm. about connection. And so because I've been able to connect to the people in their living rooms or in their, in their uh, kitchens or wherever, their bedrooms through fitness, like that has been my outlet. So I have actually been okay. Um, and another big challenge was obviously my daughter. I got married later and I was very much into my single life. So <laughs> having, a, having a child, uh, you have to be, you know, in some part selfless mm -hmm. and to put so much attention on a toddler had been difficult, but, you know, I'm able to see her grow and, you know, often mothers or just people in general say ages three to five are the enchantment years, the magical years. And I can see why, because they, they're growing at a rapid pace. Everything is novel, um, magical as well. And they make games on their own. So she's been both a blessing and a challenge. Yeah. And uh, the third, I guess, marriage, <laughs> being in one house, uh, I, we were lucky to have a, a two-story house or a small house. I think being in close proximity to someone for so long is very hard. So we Do you we mean, split. you mean in general being close to someone in proximity or do you mean specifically in relation to COVID and doing work from in home? relation in relation to COVID? And okay. Work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think a lot of people who are living in one bedroom apartments, studio apartments, um, who don't have the luxury of having space, I think that has caused a lot of breakdown in relationships of the two, whether your roommates or your family or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I was able to navigate through that um, by taking walks, you know, outside. And um, I mean, of course, I, I've been really busy uh, with an overcapacity in my in my practice. Um, so that's that's been helpful. But yeah, I really believe in separation in order to come back together. Right. Even stronger. So. Awesome. I hope that answered some of your questions. You do, oh yeah, yeah, you did. And you've presented a really real truth and things that other people are struggling with. And I, yeah, I think it's great because now people are going to know that they're not alone in this struggle. Um, there's many couples who have had to change direction and family members, not just couples, you know, having like, say you have four children in the house with you at the time that you are working from home and they're doing remote learning right? Where are you finding peace in that? Is there peace in that? You know, yeah. it, where are you giving each other the space? What does that look like? And that it is challenging and hard. It is. And there's probably even more um, arguments or disagreements sometimes about things. I do know one family who they were sharing um, like the office space. And so they had to create, they have an office space in their house and they had to create like this rotating schedule of who's going to use the office when and who, whose use of it takes priority, you know, because they had conflicting times to use it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. difficult. It's very difficult, especially um, right now, but there's a lot of people going through it. So in that people aren't alone you know, and the, the struggles, it's good to share them. That way other people um, can find the silver lining, like you said, or even laugh about it, right? Later on, some people will be looking back and laughing and saying, do you remember when we had to fight over this or that just to, you know, they yeah. will be, they will be. Yeah. I, Mary, I think you, you bring up some really good points in what you just shared. I think number one, um, there's, there's community in, in the struggle, 
we're all struggling through this collective loss, collective grief, uneasiness of government, um, social, racial affairs. Um, so in the commonality, we normalize it. It's not that you're yeah. alone, isolated. And um, you brought up laughter. I really believe to be able to laugh at yourself, to find humor in things, that's huge. I've done um, laughter yoga with at some, you know, speaking engagements and also with my conferences, you can, um, I'm sorry, with my clients, you can definitely look that up. Um, yeah. Laughter yoga, it's really, it's so, it's so like random, which in its randomness, it's funny. Um, and I think you, the first point you made and just acknowledging that it's really hard and yeah. it's okay to not be okay at this moment, because if you suppress or you pretend that everything is okay, it's, it's just going to, it'll get worse. Your, your own mental state. Yeah. It will yeah. implode later on both. Mm -hmm. And you, there's phys physiological, psychological, emotional, spiritual, um, relational, um, stress that starts to build up. Right. So acknowledgement is number one, and then you can realize how bad it is and then work from there, whether it's getting a therapist, just taking time away, getting out of the house, five minutes. Right. And we're, own, and change it. Own. You can change it. That's some, there are some things you can change this time. That's the other point too. There may be some things you can't and, you know, a political leader is in charge of whatever, I don't know, because people are going through so many different things, but there are little things that you can change in the things that you do daily, or even the way you communicate with the people that are around you or um, the way you feel towards yourself. I know other people have really like um, internalized a lot and blamed themselves for things that they have no control over. You know, it's like lighten up on yourself, people. You, you don't have to. Yeah, seriously. Seriously. Yeah, you, touch, <laughs> you touch upon, yeah, you touch upon so many good points. Self-compassion is what you're yeah. talking about. You need to learn how to be more self-compassionate and in turn self-love, right? Um, and that it is, it's a pro progress, a, pro a process. Um, yeah. And also, you had mentioned before about you sharing the office space. I think routine is really needed at this point um, in, in terms of sleep routines. You know, how is your sleep hygiene in terms of eat routines, mm -hmm. in terms of sharing space routines? I think that's a really good point. Um, and change, I mean, change is really hard, mm -hmm. but uh, I think when push comes to shove, my, my hope is that people will be like, okay, something needs to change here. Right. Yeah. What inspires you to do what you do every day and to continue to do what you do? I think that on, on a large, yeah, on a large part that does um, just bringing it back to faith and spirituality. You know, I feel that as a Christian woman, that this is my duty to, um, to utilize the gifts and talents and skills that God has given me to to help others mm -hmm. um, and through me as in conduit to help those who need help um, so there there is that larger faith-based uh, meaning behind all that I do I mean I do conduct my my therapy sessions um, according to the client so if they want faith-based uh, you know therapy then I provide that but what's underlying all of that is that I do pray for them too. So right. I think that's a huge motivator. And I think just my the disposition or the personality that I've been born with that, that I love people and I love, you know, being around people, talking to people, finding out just like you, you, you had mentioned too, that just gives me so much meaning. I could feel my serotonin levels going up hmm. um, just because we've been so absent of that. Uh, right. with isolation and you know lockdown so when I've met up with people there's this huge elation that I it's even more emphasized because it was taken away right yeah just like when you came here and did um, Zumba in the park in New York City. <laughs> just seeing people and being around even four other people um, so it was so great so <laughs> joyful so, yeah so I'm wonderful still writing I Still writing on that, Mary. And, and people don't know, but you—I mean, you're—you're you're such a beautiful dancer. But you were so kind and took videos. And 
I was excited. I was happy. I'm like, I get to be around people. <laughs> I know. We'll yeah. forever have that memory. But also outdoors, like the healing power of being in nature. Yeah. And doing Zumba in nature. It's so fun. <laughs> so fun. So fun. <laughs> Who is one person who has inspired you in your life, like inspired you beyond belief in amazing ways? It can be someone who is alive, dead, famous, not famous. Any one person who has inspired you and how have they inspired you or why? So this is a very typical answer, but I think my mother and my father, my mother is a pioneer. You know, she came to America on her own. Um, I think she was 19 or 20. Okay. And uh, she went, uh, she was sponsored by a family in Minnesota and then later on went to Wheaton College okay. in Illinois. And then she became the only woman of color in a sea of very tall white men. Um, she's of Southern Baptist tradition. Mm -hmm. And she went on to get her doctorate in Christian education. And she's also a pastor herself. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, in, in the Southern Baptist tradition, everybody knows she's a pastor, but um, she was commissioned. Right. Um, that's code word for pastor, <laughs> I think. And she's just incredible. I, she, she has more energy than I. It, she, she still does step aerobics at age 80. She looks like she's 40. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she just has more energy than I do. She was teaching in three different states in one portion of her life, New Mexico, um, three different uh, cities, I'm sorry, New Mexico, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, um, both being a pastor and also a professor. And she has a, a bug for travel. So I was, again, very blessed and privileged to travel the world when I was young. And in turn, she has really influenced my father also in his faith, um, he grew up, I believe it was is it Lutheran. I'm blanking out right now, but it wasn't Southern Baptist. Um, but he, my father is the foundation to our family. And whenever anyone meets him, he's an angel. Uh, he's, he's speaks in a very calm and gentle way and just is continually contributing in big, big ways. And God has truly blessed him. Um, he's a doctor and also a, a deacon in the church. And both of my family are church planners. So they've planted, I think, over 12 plus churches. Okay. Um, in the Korean community, um, it's, it's a tight community. So we all, I, I know people like in all over the U.S. because they all know my mom and dad being church planners. And I mean, also there's church politics. So a lot of these churches have split, but then they become more churches. Mm -hmm. So both of my parents um, have been huge influencers in my life. And also on a random note, Abe Lincoln, I, I have his birthday, February 12th. And, <laughs> I, and I studied U.S. history. I have a love for U.S. history. That was one of my, um, my majors of study in college. And just his leadership, I think, and his humbleness. And yeah, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I recommend like any books on him. So those I'm are surprised the to hear you say that. That one, <laughs> but that's great. Really? Yeah, I love. There are so many quotes of his that I really love, and the way um, he chose to stand for certain ideals that I support. I, I gather a lot of strength from that. <laughs> so oh, that's but awesome. it's great to hear you say it too. Yeah. <laughs> if there was one thing you could tell every woman or that you think every woman should know, like that one nugget you wish someone had told you or they did tell you and you found it really important once you implemented it in your life and everything. One thing that you think they should live by or whatever, what do you think that one thing would be? Or what is that one thing that you would want every woman to know? This may sound trite. I doubt um, it, go for it. <laughs> Do even, it. Even Lady Gaga sings about it. Um, but it's, it's that you are of value and you are of worth. You were created to be of value and you were created to be diamonds and gold. And, you know, this is what I work on with so many women, women of color in my therapy sessions to work on self-worth. And because of gender norms, because of historical um, 
standards, et cetera. It's, it's hard. But um, to work on your self-worth, I think that's, and to, and to know that you were created, whatever your belief is, to be someone who is, yeah, someone who deserves, deserves it all. It's not like you don't deserve this and you don't deserve that. You do deserve, you have your own rights. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, self-worth is, that's a big, big topic. And that comes along with self-love, self-compassion, self-care, boundaries in how you talk to people. You had mentioned about that, um, creating good habits and good routines. Um, but yeah, that you are of value and worth and you're worth more than gold and diamonds. Yeah, I have a, I do have a question for you because um, you've said it twice now. So you've said woman of color and it, you identify as a woman of color. Talk to me a little bit about that and explain that a little bit because some people's perception of woman of color just refers to women who are African-American or black, right? But you identify as a woman of color. So explain that a little bit and I go into a little bit more detail about your ethnic mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, I definitely identify um, as a POC, person of color. I think what that means to me is non-white, uh, non-Caucasian. Uh, growing up was difficult. Uh, I, uh, my parents, they actually met in Chicago. They immigrated separately, but they decided as a couple to not teach their children Korean. Okay. Be- was because of the uh, racism and discrimination happening in Orange County, California. Uh-huh. At the time, they didn't want us to have an accent. My mom co- constantly wanted um, us to get eye surgery um, okay. to, make her, to make her eyes bigger, um, to make your nose, and to also to break your nose so it can be um, longer. Like, it's the ideal is the Western look, the Caucasian look. She gave us white, skin whitening cream. It was always about trying to look like the white person. And okay. so th- there's such a sense of othering there and you don't belong here. And growing up lots, I mean, there was um, both, you know, um, skinheads at my high school and they would taunt and tease me. Um, I, I remember like specific Halloweens where they would come and take all my candy. Okay. Um, they would say like, I'm going to kill you. Um, go back to your country. Can you see when you smile, your eyes are so small, you know, you can use dental floss to cut, you know, as a blindfold, um, just a lot of that racial aggression. Okay. Growing up. Um, so in that othering, I definitely feel like a person of color, but that question did came up. I, I went on to, um, school in Cambridge and I was in a people of color meeting at a HANA, that's what we called it, African Sandra, are you there? Sandra. Sandra, you're cutting in and out. I can't hear you. Sandra? I have a feeling you can't hear me either.
So I'm just waiting for Sandra to come back on. We lost her. Um, she disconnected. Here she is. I'm gonna let her back in to the meeting. We'll, we'll um, go back to the Cambridge question. It looks like she's joining. Hey. Uh, hey, sorry about that. So the last no. part I heard was that you um, were at Cambridge. Oh, yes. So I, I so I went to school in Cambridge <laughs> and uh, there was a students of color meeting and a HANA okay. meeting. So okay. um, African, uh, HANA, Hispanic, Asian, Native American. Um, and yeah, like you had mentioned, there was a, a woman of African descent who came okay. and came up to me and she's like, you're a woman of color? You're white. You're basically white. And so that's been controversial with Asian, Asian American, people mm -hmm. of Asian and Asian American descent. Like a lot of people clump us in with the white Caucasian just because of the, the what people perceive as the success, the financial success, uh, the whole, um, the rioting in LA, which I was around for, was based on that. There was, um, you know, just a lot of discord between the African American and the Korean um, store owners. So I think um, we, I absolutely do identify as a person of color um, just by the mere racism right. um, that I experienced. And um, we, there is struggle. I mean, if you want to just talk about facts, like Japanese internment camp, um, right. the Chinese exclusion act, uh, when when the when the railroads were laid down in the U.S., that was all done by Chinese, um, mostly mostly, and um, they were basically treated like property. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them had died um, doing you know explo the, in the explosives of trying to open up the the railroads through the mountains. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely identify as a person of color. I hope that answers your question. Um, Thank you for explaining. Yeah. Um, yes. And it, again, it's even to draw more awareness to the feelings of um, different groups of different cultural people and what that looks like for them. And I don't know if I ever told you this, I can't remember, but my grandparents, well, I know I told you that my grandparents, my great grandparents were Lithuanian um, and they came over from Lithuania. They, when they emigrated here to the United States, they did exactly the same thing with their language. When my grandfather was being raised, he, they spoke Lithuanian in the house, but he was forbidden to speak it outside of the house. Forbidden. Yeah. Um, they did teach it to him, but they forbade him because he would be targeted. Um, he, he would be labeled um he would be ostracized and mm -hmm. he would probably be beaten up and um mm -hmm. death threats and all of that because of his ethnic background at that time and where he was coming from and the circumstance yeah. he was coming from i mean he was coming from lithuania going through a stage you know his family was coming from lithuania going through a stage of communism mm -hmm. so and they really fled here to flee from that and to not um, be killed. So they went through similar things when they came here, when they emigrated here. Yeah. And it's, so my yeah. father didn't know Lithuanian. Um, mm. He wasn't raised with it because my grandfather saw it as something that um, set him apart in a negative way. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they really, they wanted to be part of that American culture and be seen as an American. Um, and like they had to get rid of their ethnic roots and ties and everything else to be assimilated into American culture. Um, in the end, my grandfather did talk to us about the way he was raised and about Lithuanians and our cultural background and things. Um, but I think inside of himself to be able to do that, he had to resolve certain things that he mm -hmm. went through in his own childhood and being raised here in the United States right. by right. parents who were really afraid, you know, yes. of um, being targeted and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. History repeats itself. 
Mm -hmm. whenever there's and people are afraid of what is different yeah and, um yeah so yeah we didn't we didn't get to breach the topic of generational patterns like that's also a huge mm -hmm. topic um but the assimilation versus acculturation you know my mom wanted us to get plastic surgery in order to assimilate but what's more important is acculturate right to keep one's culture right and not not shove it away or erase it right but, right because all of that has value in that is what makes the united states the united states you know we are united yeah. yes but we are also united in our diversity right we are united mm -hmm. in the fact that every culture is valued here that's one of the blessings of the united states when in other countries yeah. it's not and you're forced to become someone else that you're not. And if you don't, then you're killed. That is not, that has not been or is not supposed to be part of the mentality here in the United States. You know, it has been that way in the past, right? But there is, if you look throughout history, the goal, the ideal has been supposed to to be right or has yeah was supposed to be that acculturation and 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 seeing the value in the worth in other cultures and in the you would say in some ways the individualism right how each person or each group is its own unique individual that has values gifts and worth just like you just said i mean each cultural group brings its values gifts and worth the united states itself it's one of the countries that has really lended itself to that and is supposed to be promoting that. And, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to stand firm on saying that right now. Other countries yeah. have had a lot of difficulty with this. And actually, the United States has spoken to other countries about how they need to do a better job with this. So um, it's sad. That, that is still present it's sad that that has even had to be part of our history right um my yeah ben, and just ahead. just um i mean it this is a hot button right oh now i know before, i know and we but, don't have to talk about it for long yeah but, but but from my experiences i've lived in africa i've lived in german uh, i've lived in europe both germany right. and france and i've lived in china and korea um, from my experiences, uh, you know, and I'm lucky to have them. Yes, America, in one sense, is more progressed in in its diversity, in its salad bowl mentality. But as we all can see, there's mm -hmm. still a lot. I mean, there's still a lot of uh, unknown about your own racist ways, right? right. And so this is the, this this language right now of how do I become an unracist? How do I and learn some of the, the, the norms that we were, grew up with. Um, yeah. And that's difficult, right? You really have to dig deep um, because you're right. You know, the, America really has been trying hard to be a salad bowl, but there are still people right. who make it way more difficult. But in comparison to Kenya and Germany and um, Beijing and Seoul, like I can see America is in a way 10, 20 years ahead. But still, there's but issues. still there's still issues, and we still strive to make it better, and to understand other people's feelings too. Like I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying anything that I'm saying to discount your feelings, right, or to discredit what you just said, because I I fully know that that's your experience and that's your truth, and that's what has happened to you, and there is sorrow in that. There is, there is grief in that right like and if you don't experience it now you've already grieved it right and you've accepted yourself for who you are and your identity and in your um, cultural and ethnic background um but there that does have to be acknowledged too even my great grandparents went through that and they probably i mean they took it to their grave you know mm -hmm. they didn't or that was something they could not let go of a release um in their time what they went through, not only in Lithuania, but then when they came here, you know, they should have been able to be proud of their cultural background and where they came from and able to share it freely 
with mm. their families and not feel that restraint or that restriction. Um, yeah. But I'm digressing a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to get us back on track with my last um, question. It's not really a digression because it's part of who you are. And this interview is about you and, and um, you sharing what's true for you. So it's only a digression if I go too far into my own. <laughs> so how would you define a woman full of soul? What does that look like for you? And, and where do you see that present in other women? Or where have you seen that present in other women? Or maybe you haven't. I don't know. But <laughs> um, what would you say yeah. a woman full of soul is? If you had to label like one attribute, one value yeah. to it, what's, what's that word, that first word that comes to mind to define a woman full of soul? I think uh, a woman full of soul can be any age, uh, any part of your life at any time. I think what it does encompass, though, is knowing yourself and knowing that the, what the gifts that you've been given. So a lot of it is an identity search. And once you understand, and it's any woman, you know, any woman, once you can understand what your... Um, what your gifts are and you can utilize them to benefit the world i think that's when a lot of soul can be built but i would also say my three-year-old daughter is a woman yeah. of soul it, you know in a way children there's no filter and she just you know she speaks her mind and she knows exactly what you know which gummy bear you know, she, she knows she doesn't want to go to bed at eight o'clock. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's really identifying what you, what you need um, versus what you want. I mean, of course, my daughter is all very selfish because she's three. Um, but it's, but in a way, I do think women need to be a little bit more selfish. We were so down on this word self-absorption, selfish, egotistical. But I say a lot of us women need to actually learn how to be a little bit more selfish and not do so much for others. Um, so a woman full of soul knows how to take care of herself, knows um, what the boundaries are, both in speech, physical boundaries, eating boundaries, relational boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. To know both, um, yeah, where the limits are. I, I think I already just said that. Um, and to utilize whatever gifts they have, you know, whether it be in science or. In are you there? You're cutting out again. Got to get you back on track. I'm going to have to text you because I lost you again. I don't know if you can hear me, but you're cutting out again. Can you hear me, Sandra? Sandra. I don't know if she can hear me. She's explain. I lost her again. Mm, my poor Sandra and our connection issues. Better on the phone. 